Welcome, everyone. Uh, thanks for coming to the Fireside Chat. Hope you're all having a good I.O. so far. And uh, I know I am. I, uh, you know, Google's a big enough company that, even, that, that we all learn things about what other parts of Google are doing at this event and, uh, and, and have some of the same reactions you all do to the cool stuff that's happening uh, above us or, uh, or on screen. So um, I, I'm going to, by way of introduction, I'm actually going to, I have a, a seed question for each person on the panel. We're going to go through, I'll do a short intro to who they are and ask them a question so you can hear everyone's voice, know what they are, what they're experts on. And then we have a mix of questions that some of you have submitted online already. We had that link open for a couple of days. And then we have questions everywhere from, uh, from Cape Cod to Bangalore to Belgium queued up from online. And we'll also do live questions here. So. Um, but but uh, let, me, uh, let me just go down this, this, uh, this list in order here. So uh, Joseph, Joseph Smarr, um, if you could uh, you know, introduce yourself and your role, and, uh, and then I have a question for you about the uh, Google Plus History API that we announced yesterday, and uh, what is it? What, you know, what's going on there? Cool. So hi, everybody. I'm Joseph. I'm an engineer on Google Plus. I've been working on Google Plus since it began. Um, I was very involved in the creation of circles and the sharing model initially, um, hence the t-shirt. and. Uh, done a bunch of stuff across the site, and recently I've been focused on this history API that we just launched yesterday. And the basic thinking there, if you haven't seen it, is um, we want you to be able to you know, pull in all the activity you're doing on and off Google, but share it on your own terms. Just like with circles, I can really choose exactly who I want to share with each time. You want to be able to do the same thing with activity while still taking advantage of the fact that we are living our lives increasingly digitally. So all the things you might want to talk about in the real world, like where you've been, or what you've seen, or what you've read, or what you've bought, or what you've eaten, or whatever, you know, now I'm increasingly reading my books online and watching my videos online and all that kind of thing. Um, so we should be able to help you share with that. And so the way it works, it's kind of like if you've used Instant Upload for Google+, Plus, where every time I take a photo on my camera, it's privately and automatically updated, uh, uploaded to the cloud, and then I can go through and just review the photos and then share out the ones that I want. And so it's giving me that, you know, um, it, it's the, uh, the efficiency of sort of having everything queued up for me, but where I'm still in control. And so we've opened up an API where you guys can now write anything you want from whatever app you're doing. So for example, we already showed Last.fm did an integration where every song I listen to comes into my personal history, and then I can choose to share out the ones that I want. And that's really useful for something like music where I really don't want to spam my friends with every single song that I'm listening to. But if I discover a new artist and it's got the cover art right there and there's a link to go check out the band, it's really nice to be able to say, oh yeah, I was listening to that song a lot, and I should share it. So that's basically the idea. And uh, it's just a developer preview right now. We still want to get enough content into the system that we can do more and more interesting things with it. But you can go opt in today and start programming against it. It's really easy to do. And you'll see your stuff show up right in Google+. Plus. Yeah. Th thanks, Joseph. And for anyone who wants to know more about history, you can ask questions. But also, there's a uh, history session immediately after this in the same room at, at, uh, at 5.15. So Chi, down, uh, down here from Seattle Kirkland, uh, Chi Chu, could you uh, tell us a little bit about Hangouts? I know you did a fireside chat yesterday on Hangouts, but sure. for people who weren't there, what, what should they, what, what's the Reader's Digest version? So um, I'm Chi Chu, I'm Engineer Director for Real-Time Communications, which includes um, chat and Hangouts and, and voice, Google Voice. Um, and we had a session yesterday, uh, and the, the message that uh, I, I think I have for folks uh, through, through this about the platform, the API aspect, is that we try to make it really, really simple uh, and very flexible to enhance your applications with Hangouts. You can iframe your app in in, in a really quick, uh, very little code, and then just add on additional functionality and build upon it. So almost anything that you ha any app that you have on the web, if it has collaboration where multiple people want to use it together, it's super, super easy to add Hangouts to it. Yep. Um, and then you can make it richer and richer from there. Great. Thank you, Chi. Seth, one of the uh, newest Googlers on the panel, uh, if you could introduce yourself, but also talk a little bit about, we did a launch the day before I.O. started uh, of recommendations on the plus one button. And tell us a little bit about why a publisher might care. Yeah, so, hey, I'm Seth Sternberg, and uh, I'm a product manager now focusing on all things platform. Uh, so, and I came in through the recent acquisition of Mebo. Seth, so, Seth was uh, one of the founders and the CEO of Mebo. He's being mine. So I've been here for all of two weeks. Um, <laughs> now, one thing that was really nice when I got here, uh, so as, as Mebo, we were hearing requests from publishers all the time, and be it e-commerce sites or travel sites or folks putting out content, that they really wanted uh, content recommendations in their site. They wanted some way to kind of say to a user, hey, here's some other stuff that you may really want to see on my site based on who you are and what your interests are. 
Um, and so when I got, you know, when, when the collective we got into Google a couple weeks ago, we discovered that, uh, in fact, the Google Plus team was already working on that, which is awesome. Um, and the reason why publishers were asking us for that so much, and Google had heard the exact same thing, is, as, as you all know, a lot of the traffic that you get to your websites today comes from the side door, right? It either comes from people doing a Google search, and they land on a specific page of yours in a particular, particular part of your site, or they come in from a social stream, but they're not going through your front page. And so you lose the opportunity to program to those users. So with content recommendations, you can have a user land on you know, the hotel's booking page for the hotel that they're looking for in Cabo, but you then might have the opportunity to also point them to some content about Cabo as well and move them around your site rather than having only a very transactional relationship with that user, uh, hence content recommendations. Great, thank you. Ken, Ken Norton is, uh, you know, we've seen a lot of, lot of talk about mobile at Google I.O. and, you know, for one of the uh, data points that we announced is that Google Plus is now seeing more users on mobile than on desktop. So, so with that, um, you know, what are the, what's the news? What have we done to help mobile developers in particular? Yeah, that number is pretty astonishing. I've, I've been at Google coming up on six years and just watching mobile users going from being kind of an interesting side project to a slight distraction to, okay, something you need to start taking seriously to, wow, oh my God, to, you know, wow, we should really <laughs> be building for mobile first. Uh, so I think it's really amazing to think that more than half of Google Plus users are on mobile. Uh, and I know you as developers have been, have been watching the same thing happen. And so what we've uh, announced in developer preview is a Google Plus SDK uh, for iOS, Android, and mobile web uh, to make it easier for, for you to bring Google Plus into your app. Uh, and that includes uh, sign in with Google Plus, it includes uh, plus one buttons, including making it easier to share uh, to Google Plus from within your app, and then also the new uh, history API. Uh, so we're really excited about it. It's uh, currently in developer preview. iOS is, it, is ready now. Uh, Android is coming within the next few weeks. It's, uh, it's part of the uh, Google Play services that will be going to all phones with, uh, uh, with Google Play Store, I think Froyo and above. So it's a, it's a pretty wide base and we're pretty excited about it. Thank you, Ken. Um, and Bradley, Bradley Horowitz is our VP of Product Management for all of Google+. Plus. Curious, you've been, you know, walking the halls, watching the events, new, you know, involved in a lot of the material coming up here. When you look at what the news of the week was from the eyes of a developer, what do you think developers should pay the most attention to over this week? Well, I think the high-level message is that we deeply, deeply care and depend on making you successful. And uh, all the investment that we make at Google I.O. is really in the interest of making you successful. We understand that what you want are distribution channels and the opportunity to impact the world and ultimately change the world. Uh, that's what we are trying to provide for you. And I think some of the momentum story, uh, Vic shared numbers around Google Plus adoption, the number of Google Plus upgrades, the engagement in the stream, all of this bodes toward the uh, inevitable success we feel on the team. And we want to sweep you up into that and invite you to be a part of it. And I think another uh, message I hope is, is resonating with folks is that we're pretty good listeners and pretty attuned to the dialogue that's happening between us. And so as we invite you onto the platform, um, it's intended to give you a voice and give us the feedback that will help us shape the product, shape the platform, and uh, we understand how much you have to offer in that relationship. And so, uh, you know, these fireside chats really are uh, one means of, of dialoguing with you, but those that have been working with Google for a while know that we have many, many channels of communication and depend on them to ensure that we're building a product that does indeed work for you and, and ensures your success as well as ours. Thank you, Bradley. Um, I realized I forgot to introduce myself. I'm David Glazer. I run platform engineering for the Google Plus platform. So uh, all, all of the different aspects that uh, hopefully we'll be talking about. So if any of you all have questions, please come up to the mics. I'll, I'll be trying to mix online and live questions, but there's mics in both aisles, so, uh, so feel free. Um, I'm going to start with, uh, let's see, and, and, and by the way, if any of you submitted questions and we don't get to them, there were a bunch of really good questions about the Google Plus product and the end user experience and features and roadmap that we're not covering today. So they're just out of scope for this session. So, so if you don't hear us get to your question, that's why. Um, but the, the top question that, that came in from Cape Cod, Massachusetts, 
was when will the full API for Google Plus be available to everyone? The current API, which only allows access to public data and can't be used to post, is pretty much useless. And uh, that, that's not filtered. I could, that, 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 that could have been a, a more harshly worded question. That was actually a fairly honestly worded question. So, um, and, and I'll take that one myself. I think that this is, a, this, is, this is something we thought a lot about in the early days of the platform, before Google Plus launched, you know, o over a year ago. And we, you know, deeply wanted, as Bradley just said, to make sure we were building a platform that worked for developers and that let you all build on and enhance and extend and build something that was great for our joint users. And at the same time, we knew there were a couple of failure modes around doing that. One fit, the obvious failure mode is don't give you tools, right? Well, that, that's, that's an easy one to avoid. And this question is saying, I want more tools, understood. But there's some other failure modes that we've seen out there. And one of them is to, to provide tools before we know if it's a good idea and then to change our mind, and then to change our mind again, and then to change our mind again. And we've heard from when I went out and talked to a bunch of people who have been building social media applications on top of other platforms, what it felt like to be whipsawed by policies and changing rules of engagement on other platforms. And we wanted to avoid that. And the other failure mode that we've seen is that it's possible with a platform that has uh, insufficient guidelines or tone or, or just doesn't, doesn't nudge the experience in the right direction to build something that creates a tragedy of the commons where the more that people build on the platform, the more it hurts the overall community and takes away from that momentum Bradley talks about, which is what we are all getting the value from is making users happy. So you know, when we put those all together, the, our answer was to take a pretty deliberate approach to rolling out APIs. So we have a bunch of APIs that are out there and are, are completely widely available, including a read-only API to access public information from Google+. Pretty small subset of what you might want to do, but that one's 100% available. We have another large set of APIs that let you, in a user-mediated way, help your users interact with Google+. And these are uh, both desktop and mobile and some of the brand new mobile, mobile uh, SDK widgets and, and, inter and, and, and mediated ways where you can say to a user, I want to let my users share to the Google Plus stream. Great, here's a way to do it. That involves putting up pixels that the user clicks through. And that means that we know the users are being thoughtful about their posting. We have other APIs that are available to limited sets of partners where we're experimenting with things. And we're saying, we think this is a good set of APIs, but we're not sure. And we want to be able to work with a small enough set of partners that we can actually get feedback from them and have a, have a relationship with the people who are using it so that if we change our mind, we're changing our mind in the context of a relationship. And once we know what's, what sticks, we're comfortable opening up more widely. And then finally, we have, as Joseph talked about earlier, we this week added the Google Plus API in developer preview, which is open to everybody and does add, we think, a lot of the capabilities that we've been hearing people ask for from the API, um, but, but uh, adds them in a way that has a, sort of a, 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 a circle-centric, user-centric twist, which is what we, what we like to do is stay pivoted around the users. Yeah, I was just going to add a quick comment about that that I think ties together the themes David said, which is, one of the reasons we, one of the things we could really use help from you guys is figuring out what is the right surface area for, for example, to take the example of getting posts into the stream um, that works well enough for developers and the use case that makes sense for them, but also works well enough for Google Plus and users. And I don't, I think it's complicated because when you go to share in Google Plus, you know, it's it's a rich post. You might have an attachment. You might want to choose which circles you're sharing to. You might want to choose whether to notify them. Like we built a lot of richness because we think sharing is a pretty nuanced thing, and so it's pretty hard to capture that if you're doing an automated post and the user's not in the loop, right? Yep. So if, if you pull up a share box, well, we control the UI there, and so you can have all that functionality, and you can pre-fill the content. Um, and if you write to the history API, one of the reasons it makes sense to do, besides giving the user that buffer space, is that when the user goes to share it, they then can go and choose that sort of stuff you know, when, when they're sharing it. Um, and I think, and obviously, there are cases where using a different API and having that generate a post makes sense, and so, you know, figuring out how much of that is just a really complicated API where you can basically recreate all of the same UI on your end versus setting some policy in advance, like always post to this circle. I mean, there, there's lots of possible solutions we could come up with. And I think we're really open to talking through specific examples. But if it's just, hey, I want, I'm already cross-posting to these four other sites, I want to add Google+, Plus, that's generally not going to work because we just have a different surface area, right? It's not the same as a tweet or a different kind of 
post. And so um, for anyone who wants to really think through the nitty gritty about how that would work and present us a use case that says, here's an app I'm doing where it really does make sense for the user to you know, set it and forget it or, um, or, or use my U, you know, UI, but ultimately having it take action on Google+, come show us, because I think the devil is in the details and we could actually use some more clarity there. That, by the way, is almost exactly the same answer we give internally when some internal team says, how about launching such and such an API? And we have that same conversation. Right, as, as you guys know, I mean, we're trying to unify Google right now. We're, we're, there's sort of lots of fairly separate products that are trying to get unified, and so we, we have a mini version of this platform problem just getting yeah. ourselves unified. I, I want to add a little bit, too. One of the things we hope you guys have noticed is that we have a very high-velocity team. Things are yeah. changing. Uh, Authors who wrote the Getting Started with Google Plus guide, by the time the you know, effort was done, Google Plus had changed entirely, and they sort of had to start over. Um, this is not what you want when you're a developer. Uh, you don't want to be chasing after a moving target. So I think part of what Dave's talking about in terms of the maturity of the platform um, and ensuring that we're not whipsawing the developers around is getting to a point of stability where we're confident that your efforts to build against that platform are going to be time well spent and that we're not uh, moving so fast uh, in an effort uh, you're, you're sort of chasing after us. Um, so that's an important aspect of that as well. I agree. Thank you. Question from the floor. Okay, I'm going to have to call bullshit on you guys. You answered the wrong W question. The wrong the, W. Yeah, you asked asked the answered the why don't we have it instead of when when is a time frame there was no time frame specified in <laughs> any one of your answers well, so in a win can be in a win can also be specified conditionally too yeah. like when we figure out x we're going to do this well, but there's no there's no way to hold you guys accountable to when is it going to be offered now to the, the the general question of a use case i think it's important that we separate two different users and consumers of your products because there's no reason why you have to solve everything for for both user sets of users so specifically there's a set of users that are consumers that will may install apps and have a not very not have a contractual relationship necessarily with their apps but then there's business owners who we have like the the product apis and such like that but there's no right apis to use pages to update pages which are primarily focused on businesses and you know for my case my business uh, benefits basically we act as a user's agent to manage their social web and so we're heavy contractual relationship involving exchange of money and everything else like that which is a whole lot different than did my wife install some app that's like messing up her, you know, Google profile. And I think it's, you don't have to solve the consumer problem in its entirety to recognize that if you have this thing where you say, are you charging money for the person to use your app, it is means that, you know, we're held legally liable at a much higher level with our customers than necessarily a consumer app where they pre-installed it. So back to the thing is like, when and can we break it up into consumer stuff versus business stuff and let the business stuff get ahead of the consumer stuff because of the contractual relationships? Yeah. Um, I, I, probably several of us have something yeah, to I'm say. I'm sure a lot of us have something to say. So thank you for, for calling us out on that. I think implicit in our an answer were a bunch of those preconditions. We will do this when we are certain that it will not destroy the user experience when the velocity of our team has stabilized to a point where we're not whipsawing the developers around, chasing a moving target, et cetera. Um, I'm certain that no one on this uh, panel has a specific date, if that's what you're looking for. Um, I think what you're seeing us do is gradually, with the launch of history, with uh, um, the momentum you're seeing, you're seeing the experiments that we are running in market right now play out and those learnings accrue to getting us closer to this, this date. In terms of the use case you provided, we're working with a handful, literally uh, five I think is the current number of partners that are in a business similar to yours where um, they help entities, business entities generally, but also sometimes celebrities have a presence on social media sites. And what we wanted to do was really understand what uh, is the effect of having those relationships mediated. Um, in a worst case scenario, and I'm not saying that you or others intentionally do this, but what happens is you get brochure where you get sort of least common denominator things where a handle is pulled and out sprays a tweet over here and a post over here and a post over there, and there's absolutely no engagement. It's a really inauthentic means of an entity 
engaging with an audience. And, you know, we want to create something that actually elevates the conversation where entities participate as principals in our system and actually respond to comments and don't, you know, just refer to themselves in the third person where, you know, so and so will be appearing here, but they actually say, I am, and they actually refer to themselves as, uh, you know, a person would, or uh, we in the sense of a business. And so, you know, that is our hope, and part of what these experiments are, and I don't know that we've ever talked about this publicly, but for those experiments we're running right now, we're actually looking at how is the engagement of posts that are made through this mediated system uh, faring w relative to posts where we know that the author is actually clicking on a button and watching and observing is the thesis that these are lower quality conversations, something that we can measure. Um, are, are there ways that we can help them help themselves and improve? So these are the kinds of experiments we're running, but it's all in service of ensuring that um, what is special about what we're building is not compromised inadvertently. And I think we all feel like we're sort of walking down the aisle with this golden egg and we're trembling and we don't want to screw it up because we, we feel the magic in our system. Any of you who are deeply engaged on Google Plus and have been part of this community understand that there's something special going on there and we think it's worth treating right. And, and part of our tentative nature around this is ensuring that we get it right and making sure that this experience isn't compromised. And not that anyone has a malicious agenda, but just unintentional consequences that could corrupt what, what is very special. And so again, the takeaway is we're, we're not saying we don't want to do it. We're saying we want to figure out how to do it right, so help us figure out how to do it right. And that's you know, sort of going to that next level of detail on what that integration would look like or the scenarios that it enables, et cetera. Yeah, and one thing to add in particular, because I actually expected this question. I didn't, didn't talk to you, but I've talked to other people in the halls who had very similar, well-grounded, well, well hey, I know, how to, I know how to do something good for my customers. How come you won't let me? Uh, basis. So the, uh, the update I got this morning from the team working in that particular area is that they are comfortable saying, we've looked at that experiment, we like the results of that experiment, exactly what Bradley said. We have decided to open that up more widely for what sounds like exactly your use case. I'm still not going to answer your, your W question, but, but, it is, but, but it's, uh, we, we've, we've said, yeah, we're going to do it, and now we're working on the details of the tactics of doing it as opposed to the strategic question we started with of, is it a good idea? And, and the last point I, I want to make, because I think you're, you're, you're spot on on the line you're drawing between different categories and the idea of segmenting. I, 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 I'm not sure it's a, a difference that matters, but I draw, I think, the same line you drew for a different reason. It's not between paying customers and, and, and casual users. It's between supporting the presence of brands and entities on Google Plus versus supporting the presence of people on Google Plus. And there's, there's a lot that could happen. If I get a personal thank you note from somebody that I sent a gift to, right, that there's a lot, of person, a lot of humanity in that, and therefore there's a lot of ways that it could get messed up if it got run through a fax machine and an OCR and whatever. But when I get communication in the exact same mailbox from a hotel, it's not all that personal to start with, and I'm not as worried about breaking the human touch so that, that, that there's a lot more value that can be added by software like yours with a lot less risk to the tone of the conversation. That said, I hope one of the things that Google Plus lets us do is blur that line increasingly right. because when you see celebrities or people representing brands yes. acting authentically online, it's, it's a wonderful thing. And I think you know, a lot of Google Plus engineers and other folks on, on the team are personally, like Ken posted the post about Google Plus history and then is responding to feedback directly and all that. And so, um, you know, we designed the circles model so that there's no hard line between public and private or business and personal, right? We tried to make the plus page True. profiles look like personal page profiles. So, is, you know, you don't really have to think about is this, you know, Lady Gaga the person or Lady Gaga the company or, or you know, and obviously for people that are less famous, it's even more of a blur, like Bradley, for example. It's like, you know, <laughs> he, I, I didn't, I was thinking about this, like, I don't want him to have to decide, right. do I need, like, Bradley Horowitz TM the business or like Bradley the person because I'm going to have this radically different experience with my consumers, right? Because we're right. sort of just in the middle. And, and yep. I'm glad that we don't have that. Yep. But then it complicates the line you're talking about. Other question and then I'm going to do an online one. But let's okay. Take one from there. Um, yes, so I'm just wondering how, the, how does the team um, really kind of keep its, what is the mission statement for Google Plus? In a lot of ways you think of like I, when I think of Facebook or Google Plus and like what is it for? Like and who is using it? And there's so many possible scenarios, and we're just talking a lot about a lot of them. 
here. How does it, how do you as a team think about, you know, how are you going to focus in on what your mission is and then how do you communicate that to us as well about what, what is the mission for Google Plus? What is it actually solving? Because it's not it's not as laser focused as like, you know, some other products that are much more clearly defined. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm hogging the panel here and I, I will um, surrender the mic soon. Uh, but that, that one is just too juicy for me to pass up. I, I love that question. Um, Vic alluded to this in the stats he gave. There are really, I see it, two missions. Google is an incredible set of services that have been developed over a decade through, you know, Sergey's stunt, if it shows nothing, it's that we have a healthy disregard for the impossible and we take on these ambitious, crazy tasks. I remember one of my very first meetings um, where I was lurking in a meeting with Larry and somebody was explaining to him very thoughtfully while, why what he was asking for was impossible and, and couldn't be done in a browser. And he sort of leaned back and said, maybe we should build a browser <laughs> where this is possible. <laughs> and, you know, we did. You know, he can do that. We can do that. We actually have tremendous resource. And it's amazing the company that Google is and the value that it provides in users' lives around the world. It's not perfect. And if I look at the growth of the company over the last 10 years, one of the things that I think we could have done better at was thinking more holistically about an end game, what a user's experience would be like when maps and finance and self-expression and communication were not siloed events um, in a user's life, but a more holistic approach. And I think even down to our management structure, it didn't really support any initiatives that tried to knit together these products so that they were more than the sum of the parts. And um, to our credit, I think we have fantastic services that have changed the world, uh, but there's still work to be done. And I think Google Plus plays a big role in providing that. And some of this stuff is just so blatantly obvious, like I meet someone at a party and I want to connect to that person. I have to go figure out what is your YouTube handle, you know, SushiGuy21 at YouTube. What is your blogger? Does he have a blog? Does she have a blog? How do I find that blog to connect to the content that they're producing? What is their email address? I want to get in touch with the person. What is their phone number? You know, there's so many different touch points to connect to a person. There's no good way to do that at Google. You have to do a tremendous amount of effort across all of our products. Or in this culture, a woman gets married, changes her last name. Right now, there's umpteen places where you would have to go on Google and change your profile to reflect that change. Mm -hmm. This is not a feature. This is a, a tragic bug. And one of the things that Google Plus can do is provide that social spine that Vic referred to that gives you a simple, coherent place to express who you are, who you know, and what you care about across all of Google and ultimately across the internet if that's what you wish. And in doing so, we think we can provide a better quality of service for everything we do. We can build a better phone, a better browser, better search, better ads. Everything gets elevated when Google knows a little bit more about you than just your IP address and some cookies we've put on your browser. And that is very much one of the missions of Google Plus, is to uh, turbocharge the next decade of our relationship with our users. And it's a noble mission and we're doing it. You look at what we did in local a month ago where we took local, which was this disconnected product, and brought it into the Google Plus fold so that now I can see restaurant reviews from people I know and trust. That's a no-brainer and um, I'm delighted that we've actually taken that step and it's one of many, many more that we will take over the coming quarters. That's a big part of our mission and I think of that in some ways as remedial. We're sort of fixing what's broken about Google um, and providing something really special as a result. The other part that, that Vic mentioned is um, Google Plus oh, as before, a Before you go on on yeah. that, isn't, isn't my identity on Google Plus just like a long number? Like is there a way to have like a short, like a Twitter name on Google Plus? Noted. I mean like the, you talk <laughs> about a scenario that makes it difficult for users. Like yeah. the ability for me to create a short tag name Agreed. for my identity I is totally missing now. I think we agree totally with you that now. that would be incredibly useful so that uh, when you do meet somebody at your part, at a party, you're not giving them a 16-digit hexadecimal number. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that'd be good. Um, but also, you know, search should work so well that if your name is Joe Smith, um, we ought to be able to get that person to you just knowing Joe Smith and the guy I met at the party, and you know, perhaps through uh, social graph or other means, be able to to locate you. Yeah. Um, I don't want to diverge on that. I want to talk right. a little bit more about what I see as the next part of that mission, which is I think equally exciting and. Um, important. 
it's not fun being late to market, but it does afford you certain advantages. And we had the advantage of actually talking to people and asking them what did they like about existing social networks and where could they be improved. And what we heard resoundingly was that privacy matters. And one of the things, Joseph was instrumental in coming up with the model that we call circles, context matters. When you have 2,000 friends you know, who are your kindergarten teacher and yeah. your coworkers and your friends from your church or synagogue or whatever, there's almost nothing you can say to an audience that diffuse, which is meaningful. It's checked into the Olive Garden, traffic on 101, you know, I hate Mondays. The quality of conversation is least common denominator to appeal to a diffuse audience when you don't know who you're talking to. In the real world, there are these things called walls and there's the laws of physics that you know, yeah. determine how sound travels through them. Um, we wanted to introduce that context so that when we're up here on stage, we have one posture, we have one tone, we have one vocabulary. When we're at home on the couch with our families tonight, it's very different. And that's not a character flaw, that's the way human beings are built. Yeah. And we believe Google Plus has an opportunity to reintroduce authenticity and context into social networking. And we see that the, the level and quality of discourse, the dialogue that's happening in our product, people are talking about meaningful things. We get countless stories about how Google Plus has changed people's lives, has introduced them to people that they wouldn't otherwise be connected to or know in the real world. Yeah. Um, there's just a huge opportunity to make social networking something more than ego casting, something more than watering people's farms. Not that there's anything wrong with that. Either one, you know, yeah. those are fine too, but we, we aspire to something more, and we think we have the framework, that's the special thing we're carrying down the aisle that can afford that. I think Hangouts speaks to that too. You know, going beyond 140 characters is great, but what about having the authenticity, the ability to look someone in the eye, to, to read their body language, their inflections? You know, these are really meaningful cues in human discourse and dialogue, and we think we have an opportunity to introduce them into our product. So, we think our mission is noble. It's not just about the thrilling prospect of, of unifying Google's products, but creating something which is markedly different than anything else in market that can change the world, how people communicate, how they connect, and the quality of, of, of communication that they're having. This so is so does your team busy. focus around like a single sentence? Can you boil all of that last five minutes into like one sentence? Or know, what Vic is can do that. Mission? <laughs> um, it's like Vic making, has yeah, it's that. making social work and making Google work, right? It's like, yeah. I mean, it, and and bringing your social world to Google. Yeah. I mean, I like the I like the yeah. concept of a con contextualizing our communications much better. I mean, because that's been the big you know problem with emails and all the other things that we have, and and I think it'd be great if Google could do more to help it make it easier to do like temporal and and physical location based contextualization. Like it's it's kind of difficult for me to like set up a circle with the you know, but the 12 friends I have who are here at Google Plus, yeah. you know, or the people that I, I, I'm at the I.O. And like, I'd love to see like, you know, where are they all right now and, and do more of that kind of automatically because you guys know that, you know, you yep. know where they are. You could pull those together for me and give me a much better view than than, than what I'm seeing right now on Google+. You're so Plus. Right. And, and that yeah. dovetails with a quick observation I would make in, in support of what Bradley was saying too, which is that one of the things that I think inspires us on the team is this idea that while it seems like, oh my God, there's social information overload and everybody's tweeting everything and whatever, actually, I think so much of what matters in our lives is just not getting captured at all, mm -hmm. right? Of all the sessions you've been to, what ones really blew your mind and is that gonna help somebody else who's deciding which videos to watch right. later? Like it probably didn't get captured at all. And so yeah. the more technology can help you seamlessly capture and share at the right volume with the right people in the right context. Um, there's just so much more to go after that we're, we're definitely not at the stage where we feel like we're fighting over a fixed slice of pie. All right, let me take a, let me, let me get through a couple maybe quick ones that from online. Here's one from uh, South Lake, Texas. We half covered this already. Uh, are there plans to add share, plus one, and comment features to the API? Um, Ken, do you want to talk about you know, what we are and aren't doing yeah. there? Uh, so, I mean, I think it, the, the first comment I would make is uh, back to the mobile SDK, which is uh, now much, much more accessible for, for mobile developers to do, uh, to integrate plus one, integrate share with their app. Sure. Um, I think to, to go back and, and touch on something David said earlier around uh, giving affordances that help make sure that the user is, is taking a thoughtful action. Uh, so, you know, widgets and buttons are part of this. I mean, to be able to do share box integration on your site or on your mobile app. Um, so, you know, I think what you'll see us do is more in line with that around giving you the capability to offer to your user 
um, the ability to do things like lightweight actions like plus ones or to share um, versus kind of automated uh, APIs to do it on behalf of the user. Yeah. Um, and another question uh, from Barcelona. Now that we've launched Google Plus Events, will we have an events API to add information on live, AV on live events? Uh, the, the easy standard answer there is that's a great idea and we have nothing to announce. So, uh, yeah. Request noted. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, Ken, I'm gonna give you this next one also because, uh, because you wear a couple of hats that put you in the right place to answer this. Will Google Plus history tie into maps, check-ins, and events? Uh, great question. Um, so I think as, as we think about history as we've been building it out, we've, we've, we've started to realize that there are, are different types of, of what we call moments that are relevant. Um, so some of them could just be things like a song you listen to or an article you read. But we realize that there's, there's other types of moments that are, that are um, you know, less kind of living by themselves and more kind of annotating the other moments in your life. So I mean, where you were uh, when you checked in to a restaurant or, 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 or where you were when you were with someone else, we started to realize that these are kind of interesting uh, dimensions that help make your history come alive and it's more vibrant. Um, so we're definitely uh, thinking very, very much about that. Uh, we did announce that um, Latitude is coming to, uh, to Google Plus History. It's going to be one of the, the Google sources that's connected. Uh, it's very close to it's becoming in the next few weeks. Uh, so you'll start to see, you know, if you visited a city, um, that showing up in your Google Plus History as a moment. And, it, and it's caused us to think about, you know, what is the right level of granularity for these things to, to, to show up in your, in your Google Plus History. I mean, I don't, I don't think I want, you know, a moment written every single minute when Latitude, you know, writes my lat long. Uh, I kind of want some more meaning on top of that. So, so that's one of the first sources we're going. So yeah, absolutely, location is critically important. It came up just a, a minute ago, and we think it's a, a very important part of the spine uh, for Google Plus History. Uh, so I have, I have two questions. One is, um, although I do a lot of my discussions in Google+, Plus, I lose a lot of my conversations because they flow by in the stream. So uh, there are a few hacks to, to hold on to that information, but none of them are particularly you know, bookmarkish. Uh, one that I had offered to me was to reshare it to myself to a circle that had no people in it that only I would be able to see. But then, of course, the person who shared that on a limited basis sees that I'm resharing it and goes, hey, what are you doing resharing my thing? And then I got to explain to him that it's my way of bookmarking things. Is there going to be any way of bookmarking or storing uh, posts or threads in such a way that you can go back and look through them a week later, two weeks later? It's, uh, uh, if anyone else wants to take it, I, I, I'll, I'll I'll say that that's a, a, a need that I've felt personally, that, that I have conversations like that, and I use exactly the same kind of workarounds you're talking about, so that's a pain point that several of us on the team have felt, um, and we don't have an answer to announce, but it's a, we, we agree with the, with the need. I, I, I also have, a, um, the way that we think about this for conversations and real-time communications, I think there, are, uh, I would have two categories of those that happen. One are like, broad post announcements and then the thread that goes back and forth and, and that's really interesting. And I also recognize that a lot of times people use the stream as a quick way of sending s a, an individual or a couple of people a message. So it becomes sort of a, a small private conversation and those you wanna um, have an easier way of finding. Like sometimes the only way of finding that is kind of sort of go to the profile of the person who sent it and you have to remember who sent that. Um, that problem is also something that we're definitely thinking about in our overall um, work on improving uh, real-time chats. So I, like, I guess the message for you is, this is something we acutely uh, are aware of, and we hit that every day ourselves, uh, and, and we're working on figuring out a better solution. I would say it's also just something that like the web needs in general. I mean, I, I use Instapaper, I try to bookmark stuff, I try to leave tabs open and then use Chrome to pull stuff across, and none of it really works very well. I have labels in Gmail for follow-up, I do all sorts of stuff, and it seems to me like the, the two things that go wrong one is that that idle that supposedly idle time when I'm gonna want to like bring the queue down, you know, doesn't seem to happen as much as I would think, right? And so things just sort of get queued up and queued up and queued up, and every, after a while, I'm like, okay, well, geez, I haven't read this article for a year. I'm probably not gonna read it. And I just have to like dequeue it, right? And the other thing is that that consumption pattern doesn't necessarily fit. It doesn't kind of remind you like, oh, here's a little bit of idle time. Here's the stuff you could be reading, right? And so I think most of those problems aren't even really Google Plus specific. Like we often talked about, oh, should we be able to star a post and go back and see a stream of starred posts or something like that? And you could do that. I mean, modulo the complexity and is that really the right solution or whatever? But it's, it actually isn't really, I think, Google Plus specific so much as just there's way too much stuff for me to 
always respond to everything, and there's no kind of good GTD solution for the web of like, you know, queue it up in a task in a someday maybe and then get through and pull it down. And so I, I hope people can help build that. And if you've got a good solution for that and are just waiting on some integration with Google Plus to make it really work well for that, we'll be very motivated because we all have this pain point to try to help you make it work. Yeah, I, I guess my, my reason for asking the question is because uh, I'm part of a team developing an APR, an app in Hangout called Tabletop Forge, which lets people play games, uh, Dungeons and Dragons kind of games in Hangouts. And so a lot of prep and talking goes on before the game gets started up and that you want to then reference later on. The guy says, you know, well, you can make this kind of a character and you can make that kind of a character. And by the time you actually get around to doing it two weeks later, the night before the game, you can't find the instructions that he's given you. So we'd like to be able to not only start those, but even potentially tag them and, and connect them to an event and or a hangout or a hangout in an event or something like that. Yeah, I, I agree. I, actually, we do that in our team as well. I, a couple of things that um, I would suggest there is uh, using hashtags, yeah. right? So we use a series of hashtags to sort of help find those and filter those out. And then with the addition of events where you can have a hangout schedule event, you can sort of um, bind in and put information related to that as well. So my second question, not to monopolize the microphone, is that um, in the Hangout itself, we'd like to be able to do a screen capture of the Hangout uh, and, and using the History API like you would do in the, in the party the other night where people going around taking pictures and those pictures immediately can be put up and shared as part of the event. We'd like to be able to capture the entire screen and do the same thing. So right now we could build an extension that we would have to load at the same time that we load the app and render it in HTML5, but we still can't get this, the, the film strip. It'd be ideal if the app could just have a way of grabbing the screen at a particular time. So in our game, for example, you roll the dice. If you roll really poorly, everybody freaks out, and you can see them, in the, and it's quite funny usually. And if you roll really well, everybody goes, yeah. It'd be really nice to be able to capture those moments, because those are the moments that define the experience, just to be able to capture those automatically. Right, I, that's a great suggestion, uh, and I, I agree with you. I, it's something that uh, we started to investigate. Um, there are some sort of privacy concerns about that. Uh, so it's, it's, I mean, the technology is one thing, and then there's sort of the policy privacy sort of thing that's uh, probably even, will take longer to, re to resolve. Um, but yeah, I agree with you, that's a good use case. I will say that th uh, if you looked at the private Google Plus streams of a lot of the people on the team, you would see many a screenshotted hangout that <laughs> includes you know something funny happening or people doing something weird. Especially because a lot of them take it you know place later in the evening and then everybody's a little bit you know laid back and so there's a lot of fun stuff. So uh, once again, yes, we we absolutely feel that pain. Cool. Um, uh, you, you wouldn't happen to be Ed from Cincinnati, would you? Because the next question on my list from Ed in Cincinnati is. How about write APIs for pages? Unlike users, queuing up and automating posts would rock. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm not it. <laughs> <laughs> but but I, th I, think we, I, th I think we mostly answered that previously. But, yeah. so, but as someone who was born and raised in Michigan, I resent being considered from Ohio. <laughs> <laughs> oh, how I hate Ohio State. <laughs> so um, it, it's a little bit of a follow on to my needs as someone who's a business for business um, is that one of the concerns, you know, I kind of debated even asking the question because it's kind of our selling, one of our selling points is that Google, as with many other large social networking sites, has this propensity to take down first and ask questions later. And as when you're, when you're a person, it's one thing that, hey, my post about you know, what I did this evening is taken down. It's annoying when it's marketing collateral, it's beyond annoying. And, you know, this extends to things like YouTube videos where there's various automated DMCA takedown notices to just random other things, malicious um, DMCA um, filings and such like that, that there's no, um, there, first of all, there's no real API mechanism, unless someone corrects me, there's no API mechanism where a program can monitor for such a request being filed. And there's also no, um, how to say, it, there's, there's no um, really, it doesn't really seem like there's any sort of coherent process where it's like a certain number of days that you can hire lawyers and stuff like that. This is stuff like really important for businesses, less so for people. And people get irritated by it, but businesses get ballistic. 
And since we're trying to do this, since we're building this tool to help businesses manage their social web presence, you know, being able to have a notification mechanism that there is some sort of DMCA filing against our, our customer's video is something that is useful to us. Mm -hmm. That's a really great request, thanks. I mean, you've seen, I think, Google in generally us becoming more and more transparent, as transparent as we can be uh, about these types of government requests. And obviously there's regulatory issues that we, we comply with, but um, we're, we're, we're trying to be as transparent as possible, and that's a really great suggestion, which is kind of, you know, direct notification, which is something we'll, we'll take back. For like, for some like uh, Hangouts and real-time events, um, it, it is important for us to take action um, pretty much real-time. If you think about like very popular live sports events, <laughs> if we allow them to go and to take, take them down like a couple of days later, um, that, I mean, that's a big problem. We can't, we can't do that. Um, so for real-time live streaming events, we, we, we need to take pretty quick action when we have confirmation that there's um, a violation. If, if you have ideas specific to your use case where like, we can like, satisfy the, the requirements that we have, but also help you, like, we're extremely open to brainstorming and talking through ideas. Like, we would love to engage with you to figure out how we can satisfy what you're trying to do. Yeah, one thing I'd just say, um, you know, having just joined the team really recent, so none of these guys are probably gonna say it, but I'll say it as an observation, um, is you've never seen a group of people that are more focused on just what is the right answer for the user. So, you know, I, I remember very well uh, being, you know, on the outside of this team wondering why do they make decisions that they make and why is there no API yet? Like, Mevo would have loved an API. <laughs> um, and then, you know, coming on to the inside, it's very much what is the right decision for the user and how can we really protect the user and give the user the best experience possible. And sometimes that ends up meaning that it takes a little bit longer to get kind of that right capability in the hands of developers but ultimately, hopefully, that's better for developers and the ecosystem and the users. Yeah, let's uh, take one from this side of the room. Hi, uh, I don't want to harp on the subject, but to ask again specifically about commenting, um, uh, especially for tools that like ours that ingest data. You know, users might not be using the Google Plus API or the Google Plus app or the website. They might be using some other reader tool to read data but they still want to do something with it like plus one. You can plus one now, but what about commenting? You know, it seems like something that while you're figuring out how to let people share stuff within circles and control that aspect of it, they could still be able to just add a comment. You know, a good example is the Instagram API where you can't post photos because they want to control that experience, but you can favorite them and you can comment on them. And that still gives tools that ingest data a good way to let users interact with it without taking over, you know, how you post things. Or what, what, uh, what company are you with? Uh, I'm with Scope, it's a social media aggregation tool. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's a good sense there, although I'll point out that even our commenting uh, surface is more complicated than you might think, because I can plus mention people and it auto-completes and then it expands the, you know, access control of the entire post to include those people and, right. you know, so, so you could have kind of a stripped down comments experience without some of the complexity, but like, everything we touch, like there's actually enough complexity there that it's not a no-brainer. That said, I mean, we're, I think we're very eager to do anything that improves engagement on posts. Like you saw recently, we did this thing where in Gmail, you can just comment directly from the message you get notifying you about a post. You don't have to go back over to the app to do that. And that, as you might expect, when you cut that kind of friction out, you see a you know, corresponding increase in, in engagement. So I think we're certainly, that's an area where I think everyone is pretty well aligned um, around you know, yeah, making it as easy as possible to comment as soon as you see something and have that urge. Yeah, and let me ask a specific question about your use case, both about your use case, but also as a sort of the thought process we go through in these kinds of things. If we gave you a widget of some sort that you could invoke, so that you display a post in your tool, your UI, you have a comment button. When someone clicks it, you invoke our box that pops up, which lets them type in a comment on the post. Right. Right? Would that, Fully, partially, or not at all, um, meet your need? For commenting, and if we were to, able to theme it somehow, mm -hmm. then yeah, that would be okay. For posting, like using the services SDK, I went to that talk today, that wouldn't really be ideal. You kind of take people out of the experience of okay. your app. But if it's just commenting on something, and you can make it look something like your app, that's fine, uh, yeah. Okay. But Good. just because, I mean, half of our feature requests are at Google Plus, you know, and 
to us to we tell the user, oh, well, Google's working on how to do that. And you know, they're like, well, why don't you do that? They just think it's our problem. Yeah, that, that um, makes sense. But, but, and that, but so, so thank you, because that is the path we go down to try to find that balance of good for the user, good for okay. the community. And yeah, I mean, if there was a way to comment, we would integrate it now. But yeah. so. well, perhaps not surprisingly, we face this exact challenge even internally. So when we've done our integrations in Gmail and search and everywhere else, we always have this like, hey, could we give you a little iframable widget where we still do all the rendering ourselves? or are there sort of you know performance or UI reasons why that's not good? And we've had to kind of do a mix of solutions depending on the situation. Yeah, exactly. Hi, thank you. Um, I've always been uh, a big fan of Kevin Rose's app Oink, and when he moved over to Google, it was understood that he was working on Google Plus, and then I know recently went to Google Ventures. So I was just wondering what his influence or his team's influence has been on Google Plus, and if they're still working on it, and kind of shed some light on that situation. I can take that. So in general, when we acquire or hire people, this is sort of an um, unusual quirk of Google. We rarely know what they'll be working on, and neither do they. We hire the world's best people. They're generalists most often. Um, and we give them you know, kid in a candy store access to what we're doing. And they look around and yeah, figure Seth, out where Seth, the best Seth fit is. Seth did social media for publishers, so we're having him redo our data centers next month. <laughs> <laughs> um, Kevin is one of these amazing entrepreneurs who has passions around investing. He's a prolific angel investor. He's also a great product visionary and product mind. Um, he has passions in both directions. Um, we didn't know for sure where he would land. We uh, invited him to contribute, and he continues to contribute. He's an avid fan and user of Google+. Um, his primary passions lean toward what he's doing, helping build startups and companies, and we have a unique opportunity for him with Google Ventures. Um, many other team members, it's a small team, it's not too many, uh, but uh, folks like Daniel Burka continue to contribute on Google+, and particularly around the mobile um, uh, redesigns that you've seen, they were contributors there, although there was a ton of momentum that they walked into as, as if you've been watching our trajectory, you, you'll have seen that our, our sincere redesigns of mobile predate uh, Kevin and, and his team joining us. Uh, but um, they're an incredibly talented team and uh, we always try to optimize and, and the optimization function includes both where are their skills, but also where are their interests and where are they gonna get most passionate. And so we're delighted that Kevin's at Google and we think he's gonna do a ton of good for us uh, doing what he's doing. Yeah. And, and the milk guys are definitely making Google Plus better. And I would say we've had a bunch of uh, relatively small acquisitions of really talented people that have had a huge impact inside Google+. Plus. I can think of the you know, Say Now guys or the Planner guys, or, you know, and the list goes on. So the Milk's definitely in that list, too. It's been cool. And that's partly, I think, why Google+, Plus has a pretty startup-y feel inside the company. It's not just that we kind of built something from nothing you know, in the last year uh, and getting it out, but also that we've got a lot of that entrepreneurial spirit in the people on the team. Which is therefore very intimidating for me and the rest of the Mebo team because <laughs> we got to do a good job here. But hopefully, it means it's, you know it's it's your people. It's the same, you know. Thank you. Please. Hi, my name is JP. Um, by the, the way, the hangouts. The love parachuter? Uh, no, definitely not. Okay. Um, I love adrenaline, no, but not that much. Um, Love Hangouts, by the way. We use it uh, internally in our company. Uh, we have a small business to business app. And I think one of the themes I hear from the business guys, and I think more B2B, not B2C, when, and I see a lot of potential for Google Plus, um, the platform, and rolling it out for businesses in, in our context. And I think a theme I keep hearing is just allowing us the ability to plan our dev around your dev. You lead the way, and if you do want us to integrate with your APIs, and we're all in. We're in the apps marketplace. We have a gadget and all that good stuff. Um, but as you guys think beyond features, 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 and functionality, where I'd just like to open the conversation and have you guys be a little bit more committal. And I, that's just the theme I keep hearing is share, share back. Because not being uh, committing to a date or committing to, to shipping, I get it, right? I'm on the other side of the fence um, more often than not. But to enter the dance with you and go all in on Google and really build our app around around you guys or with you guys, that reciprocity would be really, really helpful. Uh, 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 understood. Okay. I, I, yeah, thank you. Okay. Uh, hi. Uh, I got two quick questions, I hope. One is, like you, you mentioned, that it's important to keep one identity of the user. And just as a comment, I have a Google Plus account. I have Google app 
domain, so I have Google Plus account there. I have another domain, I have Google Plus account there. So I have three Google Plus accounts, people add me different of my accounts into their circles. It's quite a bit of a mess. So am I the only one? No, all of us are in that situation. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we all have our Google accounts and many of us have vanity domains. And yeah, it's, it's um, lame. Yeah, it hurts. We're aware of this. It turns out to be a more nuanced and complicated problem than you would imagine at first glance. At I, I least can, yeah. We have felt that way as we have struggled to uh, provide the right tools and, and remedies to this situation. But, uh, you know, it's not you, it's us. We're working on it. Uh, okay. And the second question is about um, like really more social engagement or like communications is like there is API to share or to do the post, but really like what about listening, right? Or to actually keep the conversation alive, right? So if let's say we generate the post share to the circle and it starts generating some activity, a week later, there's really not not much way to actually get back to that or keep track of there is some activity on the two week old post. So you're talking about at the product level. Uh, that's, a, that's actually a really good feature request. So so you you want you want an API that tell that would send you a signal that says hey this post has a lot of activity. L let's there. say yeah like someone I want to I mean that that was a wonderful example about the hike right I'm planning the hike to like Mount Rainier in three months. If I post it now, in two weeks, it will fall off the radar. No one will remember that. No one will be able to find that. So for discussions which are not really within like day or two, um, right now it's kind of, and it, it, it's not just Google Plus. It's actually, I think it's a quite a common issue within social media, but that just, just kind of one of the comments I have that I think it's, it, it would be a good thing to improve, right? Yeah, totally. I mean, one thing that excites me about working on Google Plus inside of Google is that so many of the surfaces I go to when I'm looking stuff up, whether, my, whether it's a search or I'm looking up stuff on a map or I'm going to my calendar or I'm going to my phone, you know, these are all, in theory, surfaces where we can pull from that stream, including the deeper content that's fallen off when it's only reverse chronological, right? So I, I sort of think of the, the content going in. That's one of the reasons why I'm passionate about history. Everything that comes in is collected in this sort of database of shares or the sort of wisdom of your crowd or whatever. And I think right now, uh, as an industry, we don't do a very good job of providing lots of different pivots into that database. But I think there's no reason why we couldn't and shouldn't. And, and you see a bit of that now with uh, the Search Plus Your World integration where you know, Google Search is really reaching into all the privacy aware you know, photos and shares and so forth and pulling that information out. But it's just scratching the surface when you really think about all the scenarios where yeah. that could be pulled out. And, and I, I think people would share a lot more if they knew I am going to be able to get that back when I need it, or when my friend goes and looks for that thing three months from now, they're going to be able to find that information. And right. so I think it creates a virtuous cycle if it's done right. right. Because, yeah, with history, it's my personal history, where with share, it's more of a discussion, right? Right. Although even with your history, not only you can share explicitly, you can also go in and make the data available to, say, your friend circle or people without having to make a post about everything. Um, and so, you know, and right now, the main way that that surfaces is if you go to somebody's profile, you could see more of their stuff, but it's along that whole idea of just get the data in, make it available, and then hopefully we can do more and more interesting things with it over time. But wouldn't making the sh history available to others be the same as a post? No? You, you should, uh, no, no, good, great question. Uh, if, uh, stick around for the next session and uh, either grab us in between or ask afterwards. There's an important but subtle difference there. Um, we have just over a minute left, uh, and uh, most of the remaining platform questions in the, in the online forum in the moderator are about history, so if, uh, if you ask one of those, please you know, stick around, come back for the next session, we can take them there. And um, I think, let me, uh, let, let me see, I'm, I'm going to put everyone on the spot and ask you for, you know, for a 10 second sound bite, just see what happens, I have no idea. So I'm, I'm, I'm vamping for just 20 seconds, just so people have time to come up with something, sort of a, a closing thought around, around uh, the Google Plus platform and w either what you learn from developers today or your thoughts on what we should do next. So Bradley looks like he's got a mic ready, ready to go. Sergey, we need you. <laughs> uh, help us make Google awesome. Yeah, um, sjs at google.com. I really want to know like, what you guys want to see out of the Google Plus as a platform. For Hangouts, uh, Hangouts API, we tune and design our APIs and prioritize based upon what you're trying to do. And the team holds uh, Hangouts 
every Thursday where we like engage and we talk and we like get feedback from you. Like please engage with us, come us and give us the feedback and we will tune our APIs, what we do and how we do it uh, based on your needs. And we didn't get to talk about it much today, but you know, we, we don't want to just make Google Plus platform social. We want to make the whole web social. And so anything you can do to help us think through as we open up our platform, how we can do it in ways that aren't just about plugging into our particular social stack, but about making social gestures and profile and identity and sharing you know, more sort of web native. Um, we're, we still really care about that and want to hear your thoughts about it. All right. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much. I appreciate it.